Hello and welcome to Raylene Math. In this video we are going to derive the volume of the frustrum of a cone. Now a frustrum of a cone is when you take a big cone and you chop it off and remove a smaller cone like removing this red one. What you're left with is this lampshade kind of object. So we're going to find the volume of that lampshade. So the first thing we need to do is superimpose a coordinate system so that we can start to come up with some coordinates and some equations uh, that we can use for setting up an integral. So pause the video, put in your coordinate system and do some labeling and see how you get on. Okay, I'm going to decide to put my origin at the center of the bottom circle. So I have my x-axis and my y-axis like this. And this allows me to see a region, a trapezoid, with a slant side, two horizontal lines, and the y-axis as a vertical line, which is going to be revolved. Now we're going to revolve that region around the y-axis and come up with some circular cross-sections. So I'm going to identify a point here, a point here along the x-axis at big R comma zero, this one at little r comma h, and a typical point that lies on the curve, which is this line that we are revolving, um, at a point p which has a variable x and a variable y coordinate the x and the y coordinates change. So we can come up with the mirror image and we can see the circular cross section that results. So this allows us to start thinking about our volume and volume is equal to the integral of a little bit of volume which is going to be the integral of area times a little bit of thickness. Now we need to think about the thickness. In this case we have a pancake on a plate and the thickness is dy. So we can start by considering the circle has an area of pi r squared and in this case the radius is going from a point on the y-axis, a center point if you will, at x coordinate of 0, but in the same height as point B, P, having the y-coordinate called y. And so our radius is going to be a change in x, x minus 0, and then we square it because it's pi r squared. Then that is a two-dimensional um, area multiplied by dy gives us a volume. So this looks good except for one small problem. Uh, well, before we're quite ready, we do need some bounds, and we need to see that all of these surface area, or rather cross sections, like this one here, are stacked from a height of 0 until the height of y equals h. So we see the bounds for our integral go from 0 to h. But the small problem we have is that we are integrating with respect to y, and this integral has a variable that is not y. Pi, of course, is not a variable, it's a constant, but x does change, and so we need to eliminate x and get it in terms of y. We do that by considering that there's a relationship for the points p with coordinates unknown x and y, and the relationship is that they lie on a line. So we want to come up with the equation of that line. There are lots of ways to do it. You can pause it and do it for yourself, but I'm going to consider doing it using similar triangles. So the point p, x, y, lies on the same line as point a, r comma h and point b big r comma zero and I can see a smaller green triangle and a bigger blue triangle both of which are similar to each other and therefore I can make constant slope of rise over run. If I make a rise over run for the big triangle or the height over the base I got h minus zero over little r minus big r and that has to equal the same slope or the same ratio of y minus 0 over x minus r. So just pause the video and come up with an equation for y out of that and then rearrange it for x so that we can eliminate x in the equation. If we do this we get y minus 0 or y is equal to the slope h min over r minus r times x minus r, which of course is the same as the point slope form y minus 0 here and x minus r here. But we need to eliminate x, so I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal and then add r to the other side. So x is equal to big R plus the reciprocal of the slope multiplied by y. We're going to take that expression and substitute it into the integral to work out the volume. Therefore we have that the volume is equal to pi times the integral from 0 to h of this radius expression, which is now expressed in terms of y to be squared and then multiplied by the thickness. So we have a three-dimensional volume expression here 
an infinitely thin one, and then we have an infinite number of them that we are going to sum or accumulate. So now pause the video, work out this integral, keeping in mind that every letter except for y is a variable, and so they are, con sorry, is a constant, only y is the variable. Pause it, take a look at working this out yourself, and then check back in to see how you did. Okay, we're going to expand this, uh, and we realize that we've got two terms inside to be squared, but one of them has a denominator. So the first thing I want to do is actually multiply this first term by 1 in the form of h over h, so that I have a common denominator. When you have a fraction to be squared, or raised to any exponent, you apply the exponent to the numerator and to the denominator. So when we expand this, we're going to get a common denominator of h squared. I'm going to take that common factor, that common denominator of h squared, and factor it out directly in front of the integral in one step. So now we have a simpler looking integrand, the function to be integrated, of r plus r minus big R quantity times y all squared times dy. And we can see this as an a plus b to be squared. And thinking about it, a plus b to be squared is actually the area of a square whose dimensions are a plus b. Now a plus b can be expressed as a plus b like this, and the other a plus b can be broken up as a plus b. And so we end up seeing two squares and two rectangles here. The area of the first square is going to be a times a, which is a squared, and the smaller square from my picture has an area of b squared. The two rectangles are identical with areas of ba or ab, which is the same. And so this is how we get the formula or the expansion of squaring the first, multiplying the terms together and doubling, and then squaring the last. So that's what we are going to apply here in one step to get pi over h squared times the integral from 0 to h, square the first, multiply together and double. Oh, I've lost my h, so let me just put it back in here. So if I square the first term, it's going to be h squared r squared, or r squared h squared. So we get r squared h squared plus 2rh r minus r times y, plus r minus big R in brackets squared, multiplied by y squared, and all of that quantity times dy. So we can see that we are going to be integrating with respect to y. We have a constant term, y to the 0. We have a linear term, y to the 1. And we have a quadratic term, y squared. So we perform the antiderivative using the power rule for antiderivatives. We get r squared h squared times y to the 1 plus 2rh times r minus big R times y to the exponent 2 over 2 and then plus big R minus, small r minus big R, all squared times y to the exponent 3 over 3. And we don't have any dy left because we've performed the instructions of integration. We just now need to evaluate. I'm going to reduce this 2 over 2, and I'm going to get a common denominator with the 3 that's left. So I'm going to take the, ter the first term and multiply by 1 in the form of 3 over 3, and I'm going to multiply the second term by 1 in the form of 3 over 3. So I'm actually just going to tidy this up and put 3 over 3 here. So furthermore, that 3 is a common factor now, so I'm going to take that common factor of 3 and I'm going to factor it out and put it in the denominator outside. So now we have pi divided by 3h squared and when we expand, we know that we are going to evaluate with the top bound plugged in minus the bottom bound plugged in. The bottom bound is going to be plugged into a polynomial where each term can be substituted for 0. So the last or the second term is going to be 0. So when we substitute h in for y, we get 3 big R squared h squared times h, which is h cubed, then plus 3 big R times h, but then y is going to be uh, h, so we're going to get y h squared times h is h cubed. And lastly we get little r minus big R all squared times h cubed. Again we see a common factor, 
of h cubed in each of the three terms. So I'm going to factor that out, and I'm going to put it in front, and then we're going to reduce the h cubed over h squared. And so let's see what we get now. We have that volume is equal to, we're reducing the h's and we're going to get pi h divided by 3. And inside the brackets we are going to have 3 big R squared plus 3R times, that's big R, times little minus big R, and then plus little minus big R all squared. And so a little bit of expansion and collecting any like terms. We can see that the three big R squareds will cancel and we can square the binomial again by squaring the first, multiplying together and doubling, and squaring the last. 3R squared minus 3R squared cancel. These terms here are actually the same because little times big R can commute so that we have only one of those terms remaining. And so for the three terms that we have left, we have big R squared plus one big R times little r plus one little r squared. And this is the formula for the volume of a cone. You should try to take a full cone minus a smaller cone and see if you get the formula for the frustum of a cone that results when you remove it. So if we removed here, the frustum of a cone would be this piece here. And we recall that the formula for the fr uh, a, a cone is going to be one-third times the area of the base multiplied by the altitude or the height. So give that a shot and see if you can't confirm the same answer we got using calculator, or rather using calculus, because it's always good to have a second strategy. Thanks for checking out this video, and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.